prayer will be given by the Reverend Lawrence A. Todd Sr., Lighthouse Assembly of God. And please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Welcome, Pastor Todd. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for this day and the many blessings we have received. Please instruct us and teach us in the way that we should go in this meeting. Please counsel us with your loving eyes on us. Let your aims in this meeting be aligned with our aims in this meeting be aligned with your direction. Let our plans be orchestrated by you. Father, let your will be done in this city council so that this can be a meeting that is based upon your desires for us. Give each person clarity of mind, creativity, compassion, due diligence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Whatever you want to result from this meeting, let it happen. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, please call the roll. Mrs. Doyle? Here. Mrs. Graves? Here. Mrs. Johnson? Here. Mrs. McClellan? Here. Mr. Riddick? Here. Mr. Smeagle? Here. Mr. Thomas? Here. Dr. Here. Alexander? Here. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please read uh, the uh, motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the previous meeting. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Yeah. Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. Mr. Clerk, please uh, read the resolution certifying the closed meeting. I have a resolution certifying a closed meeting of the Council of the City of Norfolk in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Adopt the resolution, Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the benefit of those who do not regularly attend, the council meetings, our procedure is to take up ceremonial items first. Next, we'll take up public hearings, then the consent agenda, which will be voted on in a block. If any member of the council or the public wishes to discuss an item, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Following the consent agenda, we will take up the regular agenda items in the order as they appear on the docket. Upon the completion of the agenda, we will then take up any new business to come before the council. To address the council, you should have registered to speak in the lobby of the council chamber or downstairs before 7 p.m. When your name is called, please come to the podium, state your name and your address, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Mr. Clerk, IB1, motion is to continue until March 3rd. Okay, so I'll read, I'll go ahead and read this and then yes. we'll make a motion to continue that. The next item is a receipt of bids pursuant to invitation to bid and notice a public hearing scheduled this day pursuant to state law. Public notice having been inserted in the local press by the city clerk to accept bids for a long-term garage parking agreement with a term of up to 10 years with the right to extend the term for up to two periods of five years each. For the lease of up to 581 parking spaces in the commercial place garage located at 520 East Main Street in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, subject to certain terms and conditions. Motions continue to March the 3rd, 2020. This I so is... move. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, I'm just a little bit confused. Were we going to accept the bid and then continue it 
or were we not taking any bids tonight? Not taking any bids tonight, sir. Okay, thank you. Second by um, Mrs. Graves, Mrs. Uh, Doyle. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Mrs. Johnson. Aye. Mrs. McClellan. Abstain. Mr. Riddick. Aye. Mr. Smeagle. Aye. Mr. Thomas. Aye. Dr. Alexander. Aye. I be two. So, so the public hearing is continued to March the third. Thank you. You're welcome. Four o'clock. Okay. Do you need a motion? No, we already have that meeting scheduled. IB2 is a receipt of bids pursuant to invitation to bid and notice of public hearing scheduled to stay pursuant to state law. Public notice having been inserted in the local press by the city clerk to accept bids for a long-term parking garage agreement with a term of up to 10 years with the right to extend the term for up to two periods of five years each for a lease of up to 118 parking spaces in the Fountain Park garage located at 130 Bank Street up to 91 spaces, parking spaces in the Waterside Garage located at 50 Martins Lane and up to 89 parking spaces in the Bank Street Garage located at 441 Bank Street in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, subject to certain terms and conditions. Is there a motion to continue to March 3rd? Yes, uh, so moved. Thank you. I second. Thank you. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Abstain. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? I just want to say I am excited for Town Bank to be investing and moving into our downtown. I look forward to having a finalized deal, hopefully by next week. Aye. Thank you. Dr. Alexander? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Clark, PH1. Public hearing one scheduled to stay under the state law to hear comments on approving a First Amendment to lease between the City of Norfolk as landlord and National Railroad Passenger Corporation as tenant so as to extend the term of the lease for a certain property located at 280 Park Avenue, Norfolk, Virginia for one additional period of five years and authorizing the City Manager to execute the First Amendment to lease on behalf of the City of Norfolk. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. I have an ordinance approving the First Amendment to lease between the City of Norfolk as landlord and National Railroad Passenger Corporation as tenant, so as to extend the term of the lease for property located at 280 Park Avenue, Norfolk, Virginia, for one additional period of five years, and authorizing the city manager to execute the first amendment to lease on behalf of the city of Norfolk, dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander. Aye. PH2. Public hearing two scheduled this day under the state law. City Planning Commission for a text amendment to the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance to add short term rental, vacation rental to HCWF1 West Freemason Historic and Cultural Conservation and HCWF2 West Freemason Historical and Cultural Conservation Zoning District in Table 3.6.11, Principal Accessory and Temporary Use Table for Historic and Cultural Conservation Base Zoning Districts. Uh, Charles Niles, do you wish to speak? Please come forward, if you do. Good evening. My name is Charles Niles. I live in Norfolk. You need a specific address? Yes. Uh, 6636 Hudson Avenue. Um, see, I want to recommend that you guys vote in approval Vote in favor of this uh, zoning amendment to allow vacation rentals in West Freemason. Approval is one step in the direction of correcting an omission, in my opinion, which caused the Freemason area to be excluded originally. This amendment provides two important items for Airbnb operators. One, it conditionally allows vacation rentals in Freemason. And two, it supports rentals of less than 30 nights when the owner does not stay on the premises. I operate an Airbnb rental established in August of 2016 by my late wife in the Freemason area. To accommodate the city's new zoning rules, I increased the minim minimum stay to two nights, from two nights to 30 nights. I do not reside on the premises, nor do I intend to do so. It's not essential for an Airbnb owner or Airbnb host to be present on the premises, but it is essential for the guest to have access to a responsive Airbnb host like me or to those acting on his or her behalf. During my time as an Airbnb host, I've encountered quite a variety of guests. One common thread among these guests is that they prefer staying in an Airbnb over a hotel. I have testimonials from several guests relating how much they've enjoyed their stays, 
I've seen repeat guests. Specific examples include relatives of patients at CHKD, military family members visiting to attend special activities such as weddings, EVMS visitors, including doctors, lecturers, and students, people who have pets, including therapy dogs, people who are participate in downtown events, especially at Scope and Chrysler Hall, performers, residents of Freemason or Ghent who stay a few days while their homes are being renovated, and former residents of Freemason area who come back to visit. Unfortunately, the longer stay requirements are not amenable to this type of guest. Shorter stays offer much more flexibility. So my, my Airbnb location benefits the city and the Freemason area in a lot of ways. Please vote in favor of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brad, Brad and Chip, Chick, right, come on up. Good evening, my name is Brady Chick. Hey. Um, my name is Brady Chick. I'm here to speak um, toward the uh, the Freemason Airbnb <coughs> proposal. Um, my my wife and I have been running an Airbnb on West Freemason right. since. Uh, Mr. I, I Chick, give us your address uh, so we can have it, sir. The address of the this particular address, property sir. is uh, three forty four West Freemason. I my wife and I live in twenty six hundred Heston Road in Virginia Beach. Thank you, sir. We lived in. We lived on Freemasons uh, from 2012 until 2017, about a year after our son was born. And it's a, it's a fourplex of a building um, that was formerly owned by the architecture firm Holland and Shriver. And they had divided it up into residential and commercial units. And then when we, when we bought the building, um, you know, we lived in two of the units. We rented out two of the units, and it was great. And um, then we moved to the beach, and we were renting the, the place out and not living on site. And the one thing about having the, the long-term rentals is they kind of tear the place up. And on a historical building, it, it takes a lot of effort to kind of restore the, the space back to get it into a rentable condition. And then you have somebody stay there for a year, and they kind of mess it up to move their stuff out. So we finally, after one of the units, the tenants moved out, we, you know, we repainted it. Like, oh, this is too adorable to let somebody just kind of put their stuff in and destroy it again. So let's try an Airbnb. We'd actually been following um, Chuck's progress on, on Airbnb. He had been doing it for a couple of years. And he had several hundred guests stay at his place. And they were just enamored with the neighborhood and with Chuck's, with Chuck's property. So we're like, well, let's give it a shot. Well, we crushed it. I mean, the place was very popular. Within a year, we had... 150, 200 guests stay there, all positive reviews. We opened up a second floor um, to that, and that was also incredibly um, popular. The, the proceeds from that have tripled what we were getting from the building on a regular you know, 12-month rental. Not to mention the building is in much, much, much better condition than when we were just allowing people to stay there and we'd you know, only see the insides maybe once every three months or so forth. I'm on site, I'm on the property probably, if not every day, you know, two or three times a week because I do all the, the cleaning and the maintenance myself. And <clears throat> I would say that the, the, only prop, the, only, the only obstacle that I'm going to have with the proposed um, addition to the languages is that my, my particular building does not have any um, off-street parking, which is going to exclude us. And I would ask the council, and I know it, it, it could be voted on tonight or maybe it could be considered for a later. Thank, thank you, sir. Okay, I, I would just like to make one point about the parking. When, when we had the, the permanent sir, residents, they each got three sir, passes. Sir, yeah, I, I think we understand, sir. Down to one for the Airbnb. So it takes off nine cars off yeah, the street. We, th we understand. Thank you so much for coming. Mr. Clerk. I have an ordinance to amend table 3.6.11 of the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance so as to allow short-term rental unit vacation rental as a use permitted by conditional use permit in their West Freemason Historic and Cultural Conservation Districts. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? I just want to thank you gentlemen for coming down here. And once this passes, I hope that you get your business license and you enroll in the opportunity to 
pay our local lodging taxes of 8%. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, and um, we are going to be looking holistically at the program and looking at parking throughout the city as well. So thank you. I vote aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigel? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. Uh, PH3? Public Hearing 3, scheduled this day under the state law on the application of Norfolk Redevelopment and Housing Authority to vacate the right-of-way of a 16-foot wide lane alley east of the Collie Avenue between Fort Front Street and Wittis Avenue. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. I have an ordinance vacating a portion of an unnamed lane between Wittis Avenue and Front Street. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Do Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. PH4? Public hearing four scheduled this day under the state law to hear comments on approving a purchase and development agreement between the City of Norfolk as seller and HAPRA LLC as buyer for certain parcels of real property and the improvements thereon, which parcels are generally known and numbered as 2517 and 2613 Hampton Boulevard. 1250 West 24th Street, 1204 and 1207 West 26th Street, and 1213 West 27th Street in the City of Norfolk. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. I have an ordinance approving a purchase and development agreement between the City of Norfolk as seller and HAPRA LLC as buyer for certain parcels of real property and the improvements there on which parcels are generally known and numbered as 2517, 2613 Hampton Boulevard, 1250 West 24th Street, 1204 and 1207 West 26th Street, and 1213 West 27th Street in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, and authorizing the city manager to execute the purchase and development agreement on behalf of the city of Norfolk. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. Mr. Clerk, uh, the consent agenda, uh, including C1 through C14, will be voted in the block except C8. Remove C8 from the block. Thank you. Approve the consent C8. agenda. I'm sorry, C18. No, C8. 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 Through C18. Through okay. C18, but Thank remove you. C8 from the block. Approve Thank the you. consent agenda and dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinances adopt twice with the effective date, C1 through C18, with the exception of C8. Mrs. Doyle? So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for doing that. It was at my request that we pulled this C8 and continue it generally. The idea is, to the gentleman's point who spoke earlier, I think we have a good ordinance now for our short-term vacation rentals. I view it as version 1.0, and I think we need to get to a 2.0. And that's where we need to do some work. And I know the administration right now with planning, legal, and so on are all coming together to say, what can we do to improve our short-term rental ordinance so it's more um, friendly and accommodating to the owners and those who use them? And so I know we're working on parking, payment methodology, getting civic league approval involved, um, seeing what it's what the conditions are surrounding uh, universities. And we are adding more resources from a city point of view because I think in planning, we're quite short now with the growth and the development of short-term rentals in the city. And we definitely need more resources and planning to help with the administration monitoring enforcement. So I just feel at this point, it is smart to do this and just continue it generally. So thank you, I vote in favor of that. Thank you. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? All right, the motion is to continue C8 generally. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Uh, just a procedural thing. Um, Lenny or George? Lenny. Why is, Lenny. But, uh, why is that one a consent item yeah. and the other ones That's are regular agenda. regular agenda items? Just curious. It has no stated opposition to it. And those that are, that are not opposed come to you on the consent agenda. These other four that you can see that were R1, two, four have been on before in the consent agenda. Five is... Yeah, so I think this is the point that, that Councilwoman Woman Doyle was making in terms of pulling this off. Um, so right now the process has been, as Mr. Newcomb said, that if there is an, an opposition, then we provide council an opportunity to vote on it individually. 
in neighborhoods where it hasn't been or we've not experienced opposition and the planning commission was a unanimous in favor we had moved that to the consent agenda and we're sort of reviewing how we want to handle these moving forward um and as well as all the other ordinances that may come around with uh from recommendations from staff on uh short-term rentals but that's why we did this this councilwoman doyle requested this this evening do you, do you ever foresee this reaching a point where this can just be go through planning and never have to come before council <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, as has been said well by Ms. Nicole and Mr. Mangini, that we are looking at the whole aspect of this from how it works. Yeah. And our goal is to make it as, as well oiled of a process as it works for you all, us, and the general public and the applicant. All right. Ms. Johnson? So, Mr. Newcomb, with that said, with um, C8, and I am in agreement. Um, that there's much work to be done um, concerning short-term uh, rentals and looking at the regular agenda one through six um, well one through five are one through five which all involve um, vacation rentals yes um, that would or would not require a vote tonight based on um, C8 since we are looking into how we go about to address? No. Well, we'll have to address each one of those as separate exactly. items because they're on the agenda. Uh, the first one, C8, I think you've made your, your right. wishes well known on that. As you get to these, if it is your intent to continue, and we'll have to vote on those. Understood. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Smeagol. Oh, yeah, aye. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. Mr. Mayor, can I just make a recommendation yes. that moving forward, any conditional use permit, whether 6 0 by the Planning Commission or not opposed, still come to us not on consent but on a regular agenda item until we really clean up the Airbnbs and short term rentals moving forward? So noted. Thank you. Clearly, Thank you, Ms. Dole. You mean just for? short-term rentals because we get a Correct. lot of conditional use permits. Okay. Correct. Yes. Right. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, R1. R1 is an ordinance granting a conditional use permit to authorize a short-term rental unit, vacation rental, on property located at 5001 Killam Avenue. And the Planning Commission recommends approval by 4-2 vote. Okay. Um, we have uh, Dale Ryder. Welcome. Followed by uh, Sully Callahan. Uh, my name is Dale Ryder, 824 West 49th Street. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. I have been a resident in Highland Park for 40 years and president of the Civic League for 30 plus years. I was here working with city staff in 1990 to help stem the tide when investors started building and renovating older homes into duplexes. We succeeded in getting R1 zoning in the neighborhood. I was here in 2009 when the residents of Highland Park fought long and hard to keep this particular property in R1 status. We are willing to fight hard to keep all remaining R1 properties and increase owner occupancy. Highland Park is probably one of the most transient neighborhoods in Norfolk. This is a neighborhood already in distress due to transient, its transient population. We're constantly dealing with issues such as trash, litter, noise, parking, social disorder, safety, street fights, and with the residents' fear of crime. We are witnessing crime and shootings more recently by people outside the neighborhood, most likely because they can blend in with the crowd. Adding short-term rentals will exasperate these issues. With short-term rentals, you take the neighbor out of neighborhood. At least with 12-month rentals, we have a chance to get to know our neighbors or at least recognize them. Adding these short-term rentals to the mix would increase the density for these four homes from 16 to 40. With these short-term rentals, it opens a revolving door of potentially multitudes of people in this pocket of the neighborhood. This would place a commercial entity in this single-family traditional zone. It would be like putting many hotels in place. Short-term rentals disrupt residential neighborhoods, lower property values, and lead to decrease in long-term housing. They have virtually no oversight or accountability, potentially creating a public safety issue. If these conditional use permits for short-term rentals are granted, 
with the slight business knowledge that I have, I would think maximum, maximum occupancy would be the goal. Mr. Callahan stated at the Planning Commission public hearing that his client is a super host and screens who he rents to. I can't imagine that there is a waiting list for super guests to get into these units in Highland Park. Therefore, I feel these have the potential by Mr. Hyder or another owner, if he sells, to rent to unknown guests, which could turn into some raucous events. This could occur quite regularly. This means the residents nearby have to bear the brunt of the disturbance until calls are made and police summoned, hopefully before a shooting occurs. Mr. Callahan also stated to the Planning Commission that these places look nice and are well kept. I agree they do look nice, but shouldn't all rental property owners strive for this? Students deserve a nice place to live. Let's keep these as single family traditional homes like they were built for. I'm in favor of responsible business growth with the right rules and policies in place. This is not the right time, nor absolutely not the right place. This would be putting economic impact over social impact, which would be wrong for a stressed neighborhood. Plan Norfolk 2030 strives for an increased percentage of residential units that are owner-occupied. Vision 2100 places this in the yellow area of the city, which focuses on adapting to rising waters in Norfolk and supports proposals that, are actively, that actively reduce density. In Council's own vision statement, it says that neighborhoods are designed so that people all ages can know their neighbors and travel the streets and sidewalks safely. Thank you, Mr. Here, Mr. the Mr. sense of community is strong. Thank you so much. I hope you will vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Callahan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Mayor, uh, members of Council, my name is Sully Callahan. My address is 327 Duke Street, Norfolk 23510. I'm here representing Lucky Star. Uh, I've listened to the conversations that you've had before. I've come up here to speak on R1, 2, 3, and 4, and I'm just going to address you now, if I can, on all four of them so I don't come back and repeat everything, and I hope you'll give me some leeway, uh, Mr. Mayor, in that. Um, first off, Mr. Hyder opened these um, Airbnbs in July of 2018. If the ordinance had been in place at that stage, we would be standing here today asking to renew our conditional use permit for another two years. There have been no complaints to the police, the Old Dominion police, the Norfolk police. Uh, there have been no complaints by the neighborhood. There's been no complaints by anyone. Their concerns is that things may happen. I gave you all a package, and I have it here if you still need it, which shows next door where, and I know some of you don't believe in next door, but you know, people complaining about shootings and other activities that they've complained about. But that has not taken place in this location. These locations that are there are being used <coughs> by students, families who come to visit them, people that are coming off of ships. We have people going to the MEAC tournament. We have people uh, already registered to go to uh, graduation at Old Dominion. Uh, we've got events coming up in boxing in the, uh, in the near future. We've got a lot of events in Norfolk that people are going to use these Airbnbs. We meet all the requirements of the Airbnb. We have the parking. We have the space. You have seen how nice these places are. Uh, they're very well appointed, uh, and they will be a credit to the city. We can pay the tax that needs to be paid. <clears throat> I made inquiry of the Commissioner of the Revenue and the Treasurer about trying to put something in place. And there's no vehicle to put it in place until we have the blessing of the council. The, the, the issue in Highland Park is there is a lot of rental houses. And you don't have a lot of owner-occupied houses. When the Planning Commission sent out their notice, they sent it to 47 people that live within 300 feet of this property. Of those, over 80% resided at the beach or someplace else. They don't live in that area. And so what we have is 11 people who are members of the, of the um, Civic League who come forward and they, they say, no, we don't want to have this because all these terrible things could take place. But they have not taken place. And so what has taken place is that we've been a good neighbor. We've done what we we're supposed to do. We've kept the properties up in a nice fashion. Uh, I gave you uh, literature, and hopefully you looked at it. Uh, about being a super host. He's got a lot of reviews on how well the place is uh, maintained and managed. We have other individuals here that come by and maintain it to make sure that it's done. Mr. So, Kelly, let me, uh, you have other uh, residents who want to speak, and we'll have you back because you've signed to speak uh, to all four, and you may want to save your time because if you use it all up now, you're not coming back to speak. <laughs> you, That's fair enough. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. All right. 
All right, so next on uh, R1, uh, uh, Thomas Jensen, followed by Joseph Riles. <laughs> Thomas Jensen, 750 West 52nd Street, Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I'm here in support of the Airbnb. Um, I think people have a right to be able to do what they want with their property as long as they're abiding by the laws. Um, if there are problems, there's avenues set in place for people can call, call the police. And I just, Mr. Hyder takes care of his properties. I've been to him. I've been in most of his properties, and they're all taken care of, they're clean, uh, he's a good guy, and he takes pride in what he does. And it's just my opinion, and I think that he should be allowed to do uh, what he wants there. And if there's problems, there's avenues to take care of that. And so I just support uh, allowing him to do a Airbnb. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Rios, followed by D. Hader. Good evening. Good evening. Joseph Rios, 4128 White Beam Court, live in Virginia Beach. I've been the property manager of these properties for eight years. I've not had any complaints. Uh, the people that come at the Airbnbs right now are coming from out of town, either for the college that the kids are graduating, people coming back from overseas or from sea uh, in the Navy, which I did 23 years in. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the families come down to visit with them. Uh, they don't want to pay $3,000 for a weekend. They want to pay what little price we can charge them to let them have something of comfort, just like their home, okay? And like I said, uh, as far as the shootings in they're talking about, that's not my people. Those are students further up the street. That's got nothing to do with us, okay? And I, I'm i there almost there on a daily basis. My Airbnb manager's there on a daily basis. Uh, customer has a problem, they give us a call. We show up, take care of whatever needs to be done. Um, I mean, we'd do the same thing for your families if your families decide to come in town. You know, uh, that's basically uh, what I can tell you is about the properties. I mean, we do maintain them. Uh, they're really sharp, a lot better than a lot of the homes around there. Uh, a lot of people don't care, take care of their stuff as well. We take care of ours. So they should uh, clean off their back porch before they start working on my front porch. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. D, followed by uh, Ken Dominic. Good evening, Council Mayor. Thank you for hearing us this evening. And I want to let you know my name is Dietrich Heider. I live at 2643 Cove Point Place in Virginia Beach, Virginia. But I was born and raised in this neighborhood. I was born in Norfolk General Hospital, went to Larchmont, Blair, Mari, and graduated from Old Dominion University in 1988. These homes are owned by my 10 and 6 year old daughters and I personally care for them. After developing and owning the properties for over 20 years, I've personally seen the impact and progress on this historical area. These homes were previously rented to students which presented challenges and inconsistencies for community residents. For example, if there is an issue with a student tenant, the process of eviction will take at least three months. During this time, the home is often unkempt and created an eyesore for the other residents. There's an increased likelihood of property damage and petty crime with student rentals. I'm working in service of my community through my investments. I have a vested interest in the condition of my property as a local business owner and my reputation for doing the right thing. There are pros and cons to every business, including property ownership. In this situation, there is no question that maintaining the high standards required of me as a super host is what is best for the community. I earned super host status in a record time of two months and have maintained this status for almost two years. The Airbnb designation of Superhost is only awarded after scrutiny of quality standards and consistent, and consistent positive reviews by customers. One single bad review results in a loss of Superhost status designation, meaning I never have a day off for meeting the highest quality of standards. In the past 20 months as a short-term rental property, there have been no police complaints or reports connected with any of my properties or guests staying in my homes, none. There have been 238 positive reviews, encompassing visits, visits by approximately 2,500 guests. I completely understand that for some of these property owners, 
This issue is emotionally charged, but rationally, there is no better path forward. Emotional or rational, we are moving forward, and why not do it in a way that is safe and beneficial for the city as a whole? Not only do I provide a service to our community by providing safe and clean accommodations for visitors to our city, this in turn brings revenue to local businesses and restaurants. Guests visiting my homes on vacation have money to spend, arguably increasing tourism dollars more than the average college student. Again, I am seeking to continue to serve my community by providing safe, clean, and comfortable accommodations for thousands, including families of students, business convention attendees, art festival vendors, concert and sporting event participants, and most importantly, the families of individuals serving our country. I am honored to have had the opportunity to host families of men and women prior to and post-deployment so they can give their loved one a home-cooked meal and a land-based bed as they bid farewell or welcome them home from a six to nine month deployment. A vote for me is a vote to end the status quo, and the status quo thank you is so much. dictated Mr. Mayor, from a question. short uh, around the neighborhood. Thank um, you so much, sir. Um, before you come, Dominic, uh, Councilman McClellan wants to say hello. I have a, I have a question for you, sir. Um, do you have, uh, and I, I don't know if you have this off the top of your head, what your um, rental income was for the last 12 months on this air, on the, the, the four Airbnbs? No, I, I do not. It's sort of a But I'm willing park. to pay the taxes on whatever comes in the future. Okay. I was just, I was just curious what, in ballpark, what, what the city would see as a result Substantial of this. Substantial income has been lost by not having a permit in place at this time right. by the city. Okay. Thank and I don't you. think the city can afford to lose any tax dollars. And so, these are free of charge. Thank you. For doing nothing else. But please look at my pictures of the surrounding neighborhood and understand that the vote against my project is for the status quo, and the status quo is not what I'm looking for. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Come on, sir. And you were followed by uh, Adam Belen. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. My name is Kenneth Dominique, uh, 693 George Washington Highway, Chesapeake, Virginia. I'm the owner of Echelon Service Group, the company that Mr. Hyder employs to run his Airbnbs, uh, along with the property manager, Mr. Rios. <coughs> My services that were include, he, that in itself tells you that he cares about what goes on in his neighborhood, to hire an outside entity to take care of it. Um, what the opposition won't tell you is, yeah, that shooting was happening down the street, but um, I was out there from 2 to 7 in the morning until that police car cleared. All of our properties have video surveillance on the outside. Something happens, I'm glued to this phone all the time. Motion sensor goes off, I'm on this phone making sure that this investment is taken care of. He cares about what goes on in his neighborhood. We've had the privilege of hosting 65 wedding parties since being in business. Um, some of our corporate clients include <clears throat> GoPuff, who were just recently set up a hub on Monticello. Home Depot corporate out of Atlanta, uh, <clears throat> the parent company of Spirit of Norfolk. They're actually staying with us right now for, I believe, 36, uh, three and a half months. Um, this is their, their return visitors, um, and they're planning on booking next year. Um, we are not against. We we want short. We want long term rentals. I mean, be honest. That makes man, that makes that man smile. Uh, we just don't like the opportunity. We just don't like the idea of you guys completely shutting down the long um, the short term rentals. We have to fill in the gaps. But um, I will take a 30, 60, 90 day rental over a short term rental. Um, our properties are the best around there. They're, they're beautiful. I mean, believe me, I know. I've cut that grass along with my staff. We, my staff cleans that pro those properties. My, my staff is out there with me sometimes in the morning to make sure those properties are safe. I've, I've, <clears throat> I've conversated with our neighbors. I have agreements with our local neighbors. Something happens, my phone blow, blows up. Ken, did you know this was going on? or you know, we saw something suspicious, I'm there. Um, like I said, I've been running, I've been in the Airbnb business for about three years. Um, I have 12 years of military or law enforcement experience, so kind of know how to judge a threat. Yes, there's no 100% vetting of a Airbnb guest, but I kind of belong to six organizations that help me identify troubles and threats to those, to those potential guests. Um, and they go on the blackball list. Mm -hmm. Anything crazy goes on, they're out. They break Airbnb rule. I'm on the phone with the Airbnb. You got to go. Got to go right now. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. And um, please uh, pass this. Thank you. Thank you. Adam? <coughs> Good 
Good evening, I'm Adam Bellin, 1353 Buckingham Avenue in Norfolk, Virginia. So thank you, Mr. Hardy, for your passionate advocacy for your position and for your paid staff's time here, too, also to advocate. I'm here to ask you to oppose these ordinances <coughs> because you, City Council, have hindsight available to you right now. We know that these uh, Airbnbs, as they're commonly known, cropped up all over the country. They are appropriate in certain areas. They become inappropriate in certain areas. Some localities have instituted percentage limitations for these types uh, and have demonstrated the negative impacts that these short-term rentals can have. Highland Park is a single-family neighborhood. Even with all of its rough spots and warts, that's exactly what it is. And that's what a lot of Norfolk is. As was stated earlier, the city is not quite prepared uh, to do this. Rigorous screening is required. Rules and policies set forth for the short-term rentals are somewhat ambiguous and arbitrary, and we know that the city attorney and staff has worked hard on these ordinances, but so have others across the country. And we're seeing those, and you've seen those in the news and even locally, backpedaling on these policies. I believe there's a comment by Mr. Uh, Fraley that we've got to get our heads wrapped around this thing. So I urge you to take that time by opposing these ordinances to get your, the collective head wrapped around this. We do support responsible growth with pragmatic moves, using that information available to you and the help that you have to make the best decision possible. Please do not focus just on the dollar signs here. This is a commercialization of a residential neighborhood, and that will fundamentally change the character. <clears throat> this is a zoning change from resident to commercial. Why devalue a long-term resident? We, all of us, are the foundation of this city. And please help us keep it and improve that neighborhood. Let's fix it and fix it right. If we don't like that status quo, let's change it in the right way. So please vote to oppose this ordinance. I'm ready to take any questions if you have any. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Yes, uh, Ms. Graves, who would you like to get clarification from? Mr. So, Newcomb? Who do you, yeah. Mr. Newcomb. Uh, where is the icon? <laughs> 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 so they currently have rentals for 30 plus days. <clears throat> I think I do that right. What you have are, there were five houses built on this property. Mm -hmm. They were intentionally built for rental. They have been used for student rental up to this time. Mm -hmm. uh, as they indicated, I think in 2018, they started doing vacation rental in the units. Vacation rental Airbnb short term? Because he indicated they've got long term stays there I, now. I, so how does that, I, I how think, does that, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused on but what we don't know his doing. we don't know his records right now. What it sounded like when he went through the list, there are some people, I think the Spirit of Norfolk or others, who may have taken a longer term lease, but the people in the in the space might be rotating depending on who's coming in or out. So they can do that without a short term rental, without an Airbnb. Mm -hmm. um, um, well, essentially, if you, if, if you rent a, a dwelling unit in Norfolk and you're doing it under 30 days, you are not uh, a single-family home anymore. Okay. We look at a single-family home as being rented monthly uh, or, you know, for, for a length of period of time. When you're, the term short-term takes us right back to something that's rented for a weekend, it's rented for a week. Um, and it may be that there are people that, and I don't know his business model, but there may be people that have taken a month or two or three month leases from him, but they are rotating different people who may be visiting the area or coming and going. Okay. okay. I seem to hear a little of that or have heard that when he okay. was talking. Okay. I just wanted to get some clarity on to make sure I was understanding what I was hearing because it kind of sounded, it, to me, it sounded a little all over the place. So I'm, I'm, I understand. I appreciate that. Right, Ms. McClellan. Um, Lenny, just clarify. If this property were to be rented 31 days, that would not require a property owner to be on call. It would not require taxes to be paid. 
it would not require it to be listed with the city. Is that correct? It would be allowed as a as a basic rental. Right. And you're correct. The rules that we have put into place for short-term rental would not apply. Sure. sure. So, I mean, understanding the Civic League's concern that they want to have property owners who live there and they don't want to have rentals and a variety of folks, I get that. But the fact of the matter is in that neighborhood, I understand there's a large preponderance that are currently rented to students. Correct. And they could be rented at 30 or 60 or 90 days without any by right. Correct. And the property owners who rent to students, do they have to live? Do they, they, they don't have to, they could be in Virginia Beach, they could be in California, they could be anywhere. That is correct. Without any management on site. Yeah, we, we look at occupancy. The property is either occupied by someone who owns it and lives there or by someone who is renting the space. Um, so, I, listen, I, I think this is complicated to Councilwoman Doyle's point, and we need to get to version 2.0. I would hate to, if we voted this down now, the way this works, it takes another year, is that correct, before it could be considered again for a conditional use permit? Um, yes, that's the standard rule. So is it possible then under the spirit of what we've just done under C8 is to also continue these four properties or any of the properties that are on the regular agenda to be consistent until we have the rules in place? Is that possible? I'm, I'm trying to... Um. I'm we pretty sure you're not place. asking me, so I'm going to... Yeah, 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 no question. Um, Mr. Pishko, if we consider um, R1, 2, 3, 4 uh, to be continued generally... And five. And five, and five. to be continued generally... Just to be consistent with what we said for C8. Is, 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 is that a proper uh, request, and is it fits within our ability and our authority to do? Y yes, it's within your discretion. Can I just make a point here, Mr. Mayor, that the C1, R1, 2, 3, 4 are opposed by the Civic League. C8 had no position from the Civic League. So there was no input from the community that we were aware of. So there is a difference between those two. All right. So, um, and, we've been down this road and this has already been continued this to this continued evening. Already. Exactly. This has yeah. been continued from two months ago. With the yes. All right. Mr. Newcomb, thank you for, for, for clarification. I'm sorry. Yeah, Thank you for the clarification. Today, Thank you very much, sir. Tonight. Yes, sir. Stay close. I'm certain we'll call you again, sir. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, uh, the motion is to continue R1 generally. Call the roll. Is that a block? Are you going to do R1 through 4? I'm going to do one by one. Is there a reason why we want to continue these now? Yeah. Well, that was your... No, I didn't recommend that continuing that. I was, I'm sorry. I was, that I was not that me. Was, that was Mr. McClellan that wanted was my, to... That was my request, but I, it was based on the premise that we continued C8 because we were going to look at our our rules more generally and get to version 2.0. So I thought rather than make a decision until we're 2.0, I thought that was... The, I was just trying to be consistent. That's yeah. all. And also, I think the uh, that what Ms. McClellan mentioned, that if it's voted down, that generally we don't allow these types of measures to come back for a year. And I think that's what you were trying to avoid. Is right. that policy? It's in the zoning um, so okay. that it's uh, like any other zoning provision, not easily changed. You have the public hearing process to change the one year uh, period. Would that change, however, if they do come out with 2.0 within the year? That with new rules and regulations that they, they could apply for new um, CUP under that? This, I, it's possible. Mr. I Mayor, I, I'll, I'll withdraw my request. Okay. I mean, if, if it's the will of the council to go ahead and vote on it, I just wanted to be consistent with what I thought the other, what we were no. going with. Those to me, I believe, is two separate. C8 was different than R1234. So the request to continue is withdrawn. All right, it's before us. That was the last speaker on R1. Uh, R1 is before us. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and it up. Read notice twice and adopt the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? No. Mrs. Graves? No. Mrs. Johnson? No. Mrs. McClellan? So I was planning on voting no. Um, I really was, and I apologize. I, 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 I heard from the Civic League. They were concerned. But in hearing more tonight, 
in understanding the context of the neighborhood, um, I, I, I can't help but think this would be a positive for the neighborhood. Um, we have neighborhoods like Freemason who are asking to do this. I attended the Ghent Neighborhood League meeting last week, and they are moving in that direction as well. And while I completely appreciate the intent and the desire of the neighborhood to improve itself and to become safer and to become um, better kept and maintained, I, what I heard tonight was this is actually doing that. So I, I vote in favor. I know that's probably not going to mean anything tonight, but I appreciate you all coming down here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Yeah, I'm actually really torn on this issue because um, I was <laughs> adamantly against Airbnbs when this was first presented to council, and then um, they've kind of won me over um, over time as I've learned more about how it works and also the opportunity to be able to collect taxes on it. Um, and in Ocean View in particular, we have seen um, these really popping up mainly because there's no hotels down in Ocean View, and it's um, – and it's provided uh, opportunity for people who are coming in to live, you know, to, to enjoy Ocean View, hopefully eventually coming back and buying property there. I, the reason why I'm torn about this is because um, I, listening to what was presented tonight, you guys have made a, a really valid case. I was very happy to hear that you have um, video surveillance. That was I never saw that in any of the documents that were given to me beforehand. I've mentioned um, a gold standard when it comes to Airbnbs. I think Norfolk should adopt gold standards. Um, I'm I've been working with an Airbnb company down in Ocean View that actually puts electronic locks on their doors, and they can turn them off with a, a button so that if there is somebody partying or doing something they're not supposed to, um, they can shut them out um, so they can't get in there. Uh, and the you made some very valid arguments um, Councilwoman, my one other issue with this, however, and not to be, I don't want to sound wishy-washy on this, is that I said the neighborhood has to support it um, for me to support these. And unfortunately, you guys have not won the neighborhood over. Um, that, that has been the one big thing is that if a neighborhood wants these, then they have to own and accept them, and, and, um, uh, and then I would support it. Um, and unfortunately, they're not supporting you guys. And I, I would like for this to come back um, to us. I'm going to vote against it uh, because of the fact the neighborhood is not supporting it. But I would like them to have the opportunity to come back if we are able to clean this up. Um, I think that you, if we could clean all this up, I think more neighborhoods would want this um, if they understood the value that it does actually bring to the area and that opportunity. Um, so I'm hopeful, you know, it's, it sounds like maybe there is an opportunity for them to bring this back within a year if we, we are able to clean this up, uh, and it, I, would, I would prefer that, but I'm going to vote against it. No. Mr. Thomas? No. <clears throat> no. Sorry. Dr. Alexander? Yeah. Um, no. We don't do very many things that Tommy, R2. R2 is an ordinance granting a conditional use permit to authorize a short-term rental unit, vacation rental on property located at 5003 Killam Avenue, and by a vote of 4 to 2, Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, uh, Mr. Ryder, do you want to make your same comments, or you no, want to, I, I, you're I, fine? I same, same, say your piece, okay. Uh, Mr. Callahan. Oh, no, I heard you. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Jensen. Good, sir. All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hader? <coughs> yes, sir. Please. Yes. I'm followed by uh, Mr. Rouse, if you want to come again, and uh, Mr. Ken Dominic. The City Civic League has painted us as something less desirable than we really are, and I'd like to le let you know that the status quo is not exactly what we're looking for. We're looking to improve the neighborhood. We're looking to improve the city. We're looking to improve the tax base. We're looking to improve the country. There are two million super hosts in this world, and they're all working hard on a daily basis to make sure their customers and their clients and their guests are well taken care of, well behaved, and respect the integrity of the community they come to. And it is all protected by reviews, my reviews of them, their reviews of me. There's no wishy-washy business about this. This is real. This is the future. 
A, step, a, a, a vote against this is a step backwards. A vote for this is a step into the future. And Henry Ford was told the car would never catch on. Airbnb will catch on, and we need to get on this train and ride it. There are extra revenue streams here for the city, and I don't know if this city or any other city can refuse extra tax dollars, especially with the struggles we're experiencing now with Norfolk Southern walking out on us. The MacArthur Mall is empty. you got problems. City taxes can be raised, and they can be used for beneficial purposes like helping teachers and policemen and firefighters. And this is a step in the right direction, and those are revenues that are badly needed and can be provided, and I'm more than willing to do it. Yes, Mr. It Spiegel. takes willing owners to do this, All right, Mr. and Spiegel. I am a willing owner. Ms. Doyle, um, is there any, uh, you probably are at the Civic League or have heard from them, mm -hmm. is, are there any sticking points with the Civic League that maybe this could continue to be worked out between the two parties, or are they just that adamant against any short-term rentals? They're adamant against short-term rentals, and as of late, late as of late last week, there were discussions between, I believe, your attorney and the Civic League, and the Civic League still said no. Okay. To even is the Civic League running this city, or are you guys running this city? Sir, this is an important thank, aspect. Thank you so much. And for you need to get more super hosts involved. Sir, your time has expired. Thank, thank you for your comments. All right, Mr. Joseph, you want it, and followed by uh, Ken Dominic, if you. Uh, you signed up to speak, and Adam, yes. I, I basically have a question because I was really confused what the difference is between the T8 and the R1. If we're both wanting to do the same thing, but they're on Abbey, and we're over by the college, which, like I said, we take care of a lot of people coming from C. We take care of the uh, graduations, stuff like that. Uh, T8 is just vacationers, right? Is this what we're talking about? You mean, do you not understand my question? I do, but so you, you I'm, I'm not here. Oh, yeah, I'm waiting for an answer. Uh, you, you, you signed up to speak on, on the, uh, on R2, and we're giving you the three minutes to speak, sir. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just, you know, like I said, we're there every day. We take care of people. Uh, like you said, we do have vi videos. And we're on phones all the time. Uh, as for the first gentleman that spoke against it, he lives quite a ways down 49th Street, so he doesn't even, not even close to where our properties are uh, in visual, visually. Um, but uh, I would have to agree, a, a vote no is bad for the city. I mean, we'll still own the property. We'll still rent, you know. So it's up to you guys whether you want to collect or not. Can we collect rent? and not do taxes, but we'd rather share our monies with you guys. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do I get an answer? Thank you for my coming, question. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Johnson. I, I think the gentleman was referring to C8. Am I correct, sir? C8. I, I were the ones being held over and the other ones not? That's what I was talking about. But you were referring to C8. Am I correct, sir? Yes. You wanted to know the difference between C8 and all, all of the R1 through 5 items. Is yes. that correct, sir? Mr. Mayor, That's that Thank was you. his question. Sir, if you see Mr. Newcomb uh, after your three minutes, he'll be more than happy to explain to you uh, the difference between R1, R2, and so forth, and C8. Mr. Newcomb. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right. Ken? Thank you again. Um, two points. I employ 10 employees, Norfolk residents, that service these properties. And I pay taxes. And so we kind of just wiped that out by, I see the trend where this is going. Secondly, I'm looking at that map, and it's like the civic lead, the community's against it. But most of our neighbors are the college students and their parents who pay the tuition who come and stay at our properties. So I just want to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, Belinda, if you would like to come again, sir. Good evening, Ian. I didn't mention before, but I'm the secretary of the Highland Park Civic League, and my address is in Norfolk. So we, we are not, to be clear, and very much to your point, Mr. Smeagol, we are not asking for this. So 
just as that has been stated very clearly. And this is, as we feel, not a tourist area and thereby not exactly appropriate. As, and I said before, some areas may be appropriate. We feel this area is not. We are a single family zoned neighborhood. That's how the zoning went through. That's what the long term plans for the city have. And that's what we'd like to abide by. We have supported as a civic league responsible growth along our Collie Avenue commercially, commercially zoned corridor. Uh, Elation, Coach House, Le Grand, uh, pick a few others, Kogan's. So there are lots of opportunities for commercial growth and commercial development. So we, but we choose a very pragmatic and, uh, and as we feel a responsible business growth and business development plan. We do urge caution for you when dealing with disruptive technologies and concepts. This is one of those. It is a disruptor. We get that. It is something else. It is something new. It's a new way of doing it. But again, you have the experience of many other localities uh, that are dealing and grappling with this same issue. So getting your heads wrapped around this problem, getting the information is a great way forward. So, and I will say, I, I said don't focus on the money. I cannot wave a knowing good morning to an increased revenue stream. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, Dispense uh, with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle. I'm going to vote no, but I also want to make clear the difference between C8, there is no difference between C8 and R2. They're both vacation rental ordinance um, opportunities. The difference, though, is C8 has no input from the Civic League. There's no knowledge of the neighborhood of what their intent is as it relates to these short-term rentals, and there's never been a CUP approved in the Larchmont area. So that's why I wanted to remove that from consent and continue that generally. This does now have input R1 through 4 from the Civic League and the neighborhoods. That's one of the things we need to clean up in the ordinance is to require the Civic League to either approve or not the applications that are before us because at this point we're not aware of whether or not some of these civic leagues are in favor or not, or the neighborhoods are in favor of not. So that is the distinction between C8 and R1234. I vote no. Thank you. Mrs. Graves? Um, just sitting here listening to all of this, I think that oftentimes what we do some as council members when we have opposing parties is we often act as referees, whether it's in a civic league meeting, whether it's over coffee at a coffee shop. And um, we try our very best to um, bring all the parties together if they're on opposing sides. We've got two opposing sides here, and I think that you guys run a great business from all that um, you have shown us. Um, the community has had bad experiences, and they're a residential area. And so, you know, maybe instead of having your lawyer talk to the Civic League and you know, I don't have anything against Mr. Sully, but maybe instead of having your lawyer talk to the Civic League, maybe sitting down with them over a cup of coffee or um, with the president over a cup of coffee and talking to him and telling them, talking to the Civic League president and some of the members of the executive board and sharing with them the things that you all have shared with us and how open you are, how approachable your staff is, and all the things that you're doing to ensure that their residential neighborhood is not disruptive. I'm not going to tell you it's going to work, but I think it's a step in the right direction to try to take some of the legal mumbo jumbo out of it, which kind of mucks it up oftentimes, and puts personalities and puts real individuals back together in it. Um, we are going to have to figure out what to do with short-term rentals in neighborhoods. Um, it, it's a tough one, but this one does have input from the Civic League. And um, to be quite honest with you, they hardly ever complain about anything. Um, they're very open, and they're very um, open to new business and new ideas. And, and so it's really hard to say um, you know, that they're being obstructionist because they want their residential neighborhood to stay residential. So I vote no. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson? Um, I wish that somehow the Civic League and the owners of the property um, could have uh, um, at least talked to each other. That's really important to me. Um, and I've spent a great deal of time. I talked to the lawyer. I drilled him. <coughs> I'm, I'm going to be very honest with you. 
and he answered all my questions. I talked to Councilwoman Dole, and I also spent almost 45 minutes on the phone with my director of, of planning. Um, these uh, short-term rentals are, um, it's, it's very difficult for the city for us to, to, to deal with because there are some missing pieces to, to the puzzle. Um, but the, the community, the, it belongs to you, um, along with the owner um, of the property. Um, you're in some how connected, whether you live there or you don't, you have property in, in that community. I can only say um, that on behalf of the, the city that somehow we, we work harder to get this, this right. Um, because we're missing out on a lot of things. It's not just about um, money, it's about people. Um, but because the, the community and the business owner, I want to, to say thank you, but I vote aye. I mean, no, please. Ms. McClellan. Um, well, I'm gonna be consistent here, but I, I, I do wanna cite, we went to the uh, ODU economic luncheon uh, about a month or so ago, and one of the topics was, um, was tourism and, um, and how that impacted our economy. And the economists explained that the tourism growth is probably not gonna come so much from hotel nights, but from Airbnb and short-term rental stays. This is here. Um, we have over 630 currently operating in some form or fashion in Norfolk, although less than 10% have actually registered with the city. Um, I tried to do some research as well to understand what's happening in other communities in the state. I reached out to the city of Alexandria, which is currently um, is getting taxed. Uh, their guests are being taxed on those properties and it's being submitted to the locality. And last year, they had $436,000 in tax revenues that they received. They anticipate over half a million this year. Alexandria is a city half of our size. I would assume that, though, because of its proximity to D.C., it probably has more in proportion of, of, of short-term rentals. But it's real money. And I know it's more than money, and I appreciate that, Mr. Ryder. And you are a great Civic League president, and Highland Park is a great area. And I share my colleagues' concern that there's not an opportunity to come together and come up with a solution here because I do believe the community needs to support this too. But I, from everything that I've seen, you're doing very good things and have a really neat property, neat as in tidy. And, um, and I just think that the contrast with the student rentals is just, that's, I have a son who's in college and he rents a house. They don't take good care of those houses. Um, so at any rate, I vote aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? No. Mr. Thomas? No. Dr. Alexander? No. R3? R3 is an ordinance granting a conditional use permit to authorize a short-term rental unit, vacation rental, on property located at 5007 Killam Avenue, and the Planning Commission recommends approval by 6-0 vote. Uh, Mr. Ryder, do you want to... Uh... No, sir? All right. Mr. Callahan? I've heard what, what uh, the council has said on the first two items, and I'm sure the last two items are going to be just the same, and I thank you for considering uh, this. Um, you know, it concerns me in one respect that, that if we're going to have a model that somebody's going to have to follow, then the first step, if I understand Mr. Smeagol correctly, is we need to have the Civic League take a vote. As soon as they vote no, then we know that there's no reason to come here and spend $1,080 per property to have everybody vote no because the Civic League voted no. And so that's an issue. And so um, I think you need to, if you're going to look at it, and that's going to be the gold standard, and that's how we're going to go, then we need to, you know, then, then people will need to know that, yeah, in order to do this, you need to take over the Civic League. And then you get your own people, you crowd the, the vote, you take over the Civic League, then you can make anything you want happen in your neighborhood. If that's the way we're going, I don't think that's necessarily right. I think you, you've got, if this is not one of the nicest Airbnbs in Norfolk, show me one that's nicer. There's not. And 
I think we're throwing thousands and thousands of dollars away here by not collecting the taxes that we could get. I understand uh, what the Civic League said to say. Uh, the um, business district was uh, in support of it uh, because it means business for them to walk up to Collie Avenue and eat at their restaurants. And so um, I just think when you, when you look at it, I think that uh, we, we really are missing an opportunity here. I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate that. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jensen? No, thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hayter? Hyder. Hyder, I guess. <coughs> Are this picture still available? <laughs> City Council, this is the standard. This is what you're voting for. This is what you're going to see if you shut sure. down. Sir, sure. sir, sure. back to the podium. Uh, back to the podium, sir. If you let the opposition win, who live in Larchmont, not in Highland Park, then you're going to see more tarps on roofs that last for three years. You're going to see more furniture on the curb that doesn't get collected. You're going to see more furniture on the curb that doesn't get collected. This is all adjacent to my property. And you're going to see houses that don't get their shrubs cut, their grass cut, or their maintenance done. Okay, that's the standard of Highland Park. It's 80% non-owner occupied. That's not a strong owner occupied neighborhood. The secretary of the Highland Park Civic League is a resident of Larchmont. I don't even know what he's doing here, but I'm here to maintain my property, maintain the, the, the future of Highland Park, and maintain the future of this city. And I would appreciate a vote in our behalf because this is not what we want. This is the standard, and this is what we're fight, fighting against. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Joseph. Yeah. Um, Mr. Ken Dominique. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Smeagol, you stated earlier that, um, you know, well, some of you members stated earlier that what's the standard or, or version 2.2 you guys want to do. Um, I mean, I'm good at my job and we're the standard. I mean, four properties all at once. I mean, and you saw you saw the pictures of what we deal with. It comes to the point where my staff goes across the street to pick up trash onto, you know, these absentee landlords' properties. Across the street. They got a rule. They know that. They go pick up trash. We take other neighbors' trash cans out to the street, you know, and we pick up glass off the street. And, but... You're trying to figure out what version um, version two is. I think we're kind of it, or we're good somewhere to start. Or instead of shooting us down and penalizing us for a whole another year, I mean, how are you going to figure out how are you going to figure out version two when you just shot down the best game going into town? It's kind of weird. Adam. Adam Berlin. Thank you, Council. And I am a proud member of the Highland Park Civic League, uh, as I do have a long-term rental uh, on 49th Street. And uh, we have had other landlords on our Civic League in the past, and it has worked uh, wonderfully in order to raise those overall standards. But I do, again, encourage you to pause and find those missing <clears throat> pieces. And I do hope that there is, uh, Ms. Graves, that there is a middle ground for us uh, so that we can move forward. And with your help and the city's help, I think we can find that and we can move uh, in a good direction together that is mutually beneficial. But we need to first put into place what is needed uh, before this, this, is, this is done. And a revenue stream of, say, an extra 436 k I'm not sure that's going to be the, the end-all, be-all of things or if it's a start. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that, is, that is a number relatively small for a relatively large city and a relatively large budget. And I will say that council does not always follow us. Uh, I've had experiences with that where we've, we've, we've had to go off and we've had to fight a little bit harder, we've had to be heard, 
uh, or we've been overruled, and that's that's okay. You guys have those seats, and uh, and we sit where we are. From our from our vantage point, we all have to mesh those viewpoints, and uh, it would be great if more people moved to Highland Park, uh, and or or own businesses there, uh, and own that property and became part of that civic league. That would be fantastic. We would we would encourage people to do that because we want to hear those voices. <clears throat> Thank you. Clark. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? No. Mrs. Graves? No. Mrs. Johnson? No. Mrs. McClellan? Uh, the Planning Commission voted 6.0, 6.0, 6 to 0 in favor of this. Is that correct? I vote yes. Mr. Riddick? Yes. Mr. Smeagle? No. Mr. Thomas? No. Dr. Alexander? No. Uh, R4? Our four is an ordinance granting a conditional use permit to authorize a short-term rental unit, vacation rental on property located at 5009 Gillum Avenue. And by a vote of 6-0, Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, Mr. Ryder? Good. All right. Uh, Mr. Callahan? You good? Yes, sir. Mr. Jensen? Good. All right. Uh, Mr. Hyder? Yes, sir. You're going to have a hard time getting anybody else to step up here and do this because this is beyond absurd. We need to make this easy. We need the greasy skids. We need to make this so it's available to every property owner in any neighborhood in this city. This is a $436,000 opportunity you're throwing away. I don't understand that. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's right that the Civic League overrides the Planning Commission ever. I think the Planning Commission should ride should ride shotgun on this deal and you should follow their votes but uh you're running the city and it's all yours but uh i see problems and this could help fix them thank you thank you uh mr joseph rogers uh mr ken dominic mr belen all right mr clerk dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date mrs doyle no. Mrs. Graves? No. Mrs. Johnson? No. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Newcomb? Lenny? If this were to come back before council in a year, would the property owners be required to pay the same fees again? I mean, it would be a new application. So, yes. I, I believe in the past we, as a council, have in situations like this, I think we've determined that there's an opportunity not to refund the money, but that if this were to come back before that the charges that they've already paid, I mean, because each one of these was $1,080. Uh, and I, we, we've, it's been rare, but we've done this where there is some confusion, not, conf I wouldn't say confusion, where there's some things that need to be cleaned up you know, with the process, and I, I just feel like this would be one of those examples that uh, we may need to consider that. We can certainly give it consideration. I know it's an administrative thing, but I, I think that the amount of money that's been paid towards this to be defeated, I mean, there are always, it's a gamble, it's a risk, right. but I think the Civic League thing is always tricky, guys. That You don't live in Norfolk, um, but in Norfolk, Civic Leagues are the, the foundation of this this um, government. This is what we we've been doing. I've been on council ten years. We have almost a hundred percent have gone with what civic leagues have asked us to do. That's that's where the democratic process starts in Norfolk. So, um, but I I think in this case, you know, it's it's something to consider down the road. You know, okay. we'll consider it. Yeah. No. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Thomas. No. Dr. Alexander. No. R5. R5 is an ordinance granting a conditional use permit to authorize a short-term rental vacation rental dwelling unit on property located at 1805 Hope here. Avenue, and the Planning Commission recommends approval by 6-1 vote. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for read the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? No. Mrs. Graves? I just would like to point out in this particular instance, there is no way in one way or the other on the Civic League. I think they met with the applicant. Um, and they declined the way in so in the absence of a way in um, I vote no. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson? Um, for for this um, 
again, my research, doing my research, mm -hmm. and I'm going to vote no. Ms. McClellan? Um, Councilman Graves, just to, con um, just to clarify, so the, they did not take any opposition or, or support. support, but they were neutral. I vote okay. yes. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? I just, I, I heard coming in today that the property owner moved the sign, the announcing the um, this public hearing. They did, so. So it wasn't posted in front of the property? Mr. Newcomb, or Mr. Homewood, or both. Uh, Mr. Smear, what happened was the uh, the applicant chose to take the sign down from where it had been originally posted, and it was posted in front of the, the property, but it was posted back on the property um, in front of the foundation plantings on to the left side of the house. So it wasn't a public, where we normally put it on a telephone pole or we stake it on the front? Yeah, I mean... Yes. I mean, I think technically the ordinance says it's posted on the property. Um, we okay. frequently, if there's a utility pole there that's convenient, we put it right on the utility pole so it's it's. Were they sent uh, letters? Visible. Hmm? Were, were the letters sent to the surrounding areas yes, as well? Yeah. And yes, did we receive any comments back from any of the letters? Um, this one had a number of people opposing it um, at the, the planning commission meeting. Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear that piece of the puzzle. Sorry, that's what I was looking for. Okay, I wish they'd come tonight. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We're so glad. Yeah. Well, I'm a super aware representative. Yeah. This is me. Yeah, I just, we've, we've discussed these a lot. I don't know if we need a task force or mm -hmm. some small committee or something. The committee. I know the mayor. I mean, it is, it's a big issue. I mean, we're dealing with it. We, we talk about it all the time at VML, you know, across the state. You know, it's it's, a, it's something that's impacting all localities. Yeah, it is. And it's something that we really need to get. I, I'm more concerned about taxes not being collected. Um, uh, like they're supposed to, but I don't know. Maybe we need to talk about this further. Um, no. Mr. Thomas? No. Dr. Alexander? No. Uh, R6. R6 is an ordinance granting a conditional use permits to authorize the operation of a commercial recreation center operating after midnight with live entertainment <clears throat> named 416 Aphrodite, property located at 200 East Plume Street. And the Planning Commission recommends approval by 5-2 vote and also recommendation of a 24-month sunset clause. All right. Um, Mr. Can I ask us the relationship to the library? It's across, across the street. Yeah. There were some... Harold. Harold. Jerome? Jerome Harold. Yeah. Is he here? Yes. Huh? There's some questions. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jerome Harriel. I'm the owner of 416 Aphrodite. Um, the concept behind it was to have a family um, gaming experience with the space. While we were going through our permit process, we had a lot of um, you know information as to what not to do since the address is 200 East Plume Street. I think it used to be the Palace on Plume. Um, since going through the process, um, we've had a lot of kickback from the owner of the building. <clears throat> Um, we're at a space now where we're actually locked out of the space because he didn't provide us with the key. Um, at, at a sense of, I guess, trying to create separation between what was and what is, we asked him not to, you know, post or promote um, the things that we were doing um, for our space. And I think, um, you know, by us kind of taking that approach, he's kind of made it a little bit difficult for us. So we're trying to see if maybe we can get our process maybe um, continued so we can try to work out um, maybe some type of arrangement with him. Because I do think the concept is good for the city of Norfolk um, to have a space where kids can, you know, play games upstairs. Parents can interact downstairs. Our first event, we fed the homeless um, for Thanksgiving. Um, for MLK Day, we had it set so um, parents can bring their kids to the space so they didn't have to take off work um, to be with you know their kids. So I do think the concept <laughs> works. I just think that you know maybe we need a little bit of um, assistance with actually getting our landlord on board. You may. <laughs> okay, so 
You said gaming, so all kinds of bells went off in my head. But what mm -hmm. you're actually talking about is kids and video games. <coughs> right. Upstairs, thinking? we have Xbox One consoles. We have Nintendo Switches that are prepared to be installed after, you know, we get our permit. Um, downstairs, it's a normal restaurant. So, you know, parents can interact, you know, with their spouses and kids can play and eat upstairs. Um, we had activities for, um, like, sip and paints, you know, fashion shows, live entertainment was kind of what we were anticipating doing after we actually received our permit. Um, you know, okay. yeah. Mr. I Hare. will recommend to you as a real estate professional, if you're having trouble with your landlord and you have a lease in place, you probably need to consult with a lawyer. Um, yes. Ms. Ms. Doyle. Uh, given your comments, I would recommend perhaps that we continue this for 60 yeah. days, given your request to continue yes. so that you can work out the challenges that you're facing so that we're not voting yes or no until that time. I'll second that. All right. Yeah. Mr. Gold, the motion is to continue. 60 days or generally? <clears throat> generally, we can, we can bring it back. Continue for 60 days. Okay. okay. You'll be paying rent that entire time? Yes, um, I've been paying. Um, originally, according to our lease, we didn't have to um, pay rent until we got our permit. Right. Um, the landlord told us if that was the case, then we couldn't utilize the space until we got our permit. So since we were approved by ABC and I think the, the food and safety um, to allow us to occupy it as a restaurant only, we agreed to pay 50% of the rent until we received our permit, which we have done. Um, he did give us some, you know, additional bills that looked, you know, a little interesting. I brought one, if you want to, I don't know how that process works, but. So between yeah. generally and 60 days, if we did it generally, then he, if he got things straight within 30 days, he could come back. Mr. Pisco? That's correct. That's what I would do. Uh -huh. So should we do generally yeah, I would say, to be more flexible? I would say generally. So I modify <coughs> so my recommendation. All right, Mr. Homewood. Just a point of clarification, Mr. Reddick. Mm -hmm. um, if you um, continue to engage specific, it does not have to be re-advertised. If it's continued generally, then it will have to be re-advertised before it's so this is a, Even if it excludes the This date. is an R item that's not a public hearing? Um, yes. So, yes, it is. So there is not an advertising to be concerned with. Mr. Reddick's point is okay. correct. All right, generally. All right, thank you, sir. Thank motion you. is to consider to continue <coughs> generally. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Mrs. Doyle. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Mrs. Johnson. Aye. Mrs. McClellan. Aye. Mr. Riddick. Aye. Mr. Smeagle. Aye. Mr. Thomas. Aye. Dr. Alexander. Aye. R7. R7 is an ordinance approving a cruise ship operating agreement by and between the City of Norfolk and Carnival License Holdings Limited doing business as Carnival Cruise Line and authorizing the City Manager to execute the cruise ship operating agreement on behalf of the City of Norfolk. Call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander. All right. R8. R8 is an ordinance accepting, appropriating, and authorizing the expenditure of the sum of $1,500,000 from the Hampton Roads Sanitation District in payment of its share of cost for the Chesterfield Heights Sanitary Sewer Facilities. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle, Aye. Mr. Thomas, Aye. Dr. Alexander. Aye. R9. R9 is an ordinance approving a First Amendment to purchase and develop agreement by and between the City of Norfolk as seller and DT Builders LLC as developer for certain parcels of real property and the improvements thereon, which parcels are generally known and numbered as 1298, 1300, and 1302 East Indian River Road, 903, 1005, 1015, 1017, 1021, 1023, 1025, and 1041. Wilson Road in the city of Norfolk, Virginia, and authorizing the city manager to execute the First Amendment to purchase and develop <clears throat> agreement on behalf of the city of Norfolk. Just put a call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Abstain. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. R10. 
Part 10 is the resolution to initiate the process of vacating the public rights of way, being certain portions of Fenchurch Street, Posey Lane, Charlotte Street, and Chapel Street. Adopt the resolution. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. R11? R11 is an ordinance granting a license to CP Logistics Chesapeake LLC for the use of certain property located at the corner of Portsmouth Boulevard and Jolliffe Road in the city of Chesapeake and authorizing the city manager to enter into a license agreement on behalf of the city. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. R12. R12 is an ordinance authorizing the project administration agreement with the Virginia Department of Transportation for the design and installation of retro reflective back plate improvements appropriating and authorizing the expenditure of an amount up to $836,718 for the project. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. R13. R13 is an ordinance to amend and reordain subsection C of section 42-18 so as to correct the calculation of permit fees. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. R14. R14 is an ordinance to amend and reordain section 25-277.1 <laughs> of the Norfolk City Code 1979 so as to require vehicles to display a valid state license and inspection for parking in a public space. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? So this is for folks who want to park their car on city streets and don't have an inspection or a license plate? You can't do that, folks. I vote aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? And this came up because um, people actually put their car covers over it and cover up that they're not paying for that. So now that <laughs> changes that. So aye. Yeah. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander. Aye. R15. R15 is an ordinance to amend and reordain sections 25.2-60, 25.2-65, and 25.2-115 of the Norfolk City Code 1979 so as to add one new subsection, B, to authorize the Director of Recreation, Parks, and Open Space to designate park opening hours. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance twice and adopt with the effective date. Mrs. Doyle. Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. Do you have anything else, Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Bull? Yes, sir. Since uh, R16 and R17 were placeholders and we have moved that to the next meeting, we will not yes. vote on those tonight. But I do have one additional add-on, which is uh, to approve the Mace and Police Honor Guard for the 2020 St. Patrick's Day Parade. And... Um, I just need uh, approval of this. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Can we have the cars listed? And we're doing lime scooters. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Aye. Mrs. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Leprechaun hats, right? <laughs> Martin's going to be in his green suit <laughs> riding a lime scooter. Right? <laughs> Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Alexander? Aye. And that's all I have. All right, on a new business, uh, when your name is called, please come to the podium. Uh, state your name, your address. Please limit your comments to three minutes, and we'll start with uh, Raytron White. Raytron will be followed by uh, Jerome Harrell, if he's still here. Good afternoon, Good Mayor afternoon, Alexander Mr. and City Council. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming to Grandy Village. Our doors are always open for the greatest people in this panel. We, we enjoyed you for... Um, the city council retreat. So anytime you want to come back, you got my vote. Second of all, on the on our agenda, we um, there are kids that are moving in our neighborhood, and there was a problem. I don't know who I direct this to, and I came to you all. Um, you all can get the problem solved. Um, there are kids in the age of 16 to 17. They're um, they're in school, and just the Norfolk Public Schools are not letting them go to school because they they don't have the credit to be in the 10th or 11th grade, so they're asking them to get their GED. They're, we have about three or four kids in our neighborhood that 
their parents are taking them to the school because of they're not in the the right grade, but they have they're in the right grade, but don't have the right credits for the grade. They're asking them to go get their GED. They're not letting them in school. We have four kids in our neighborhood have not been in school all year long, and they have they was told them to tell them to to do a GED assessment test. They have the codes to get the assessment test. They won't give the kids the assessment test to take that so they can find where they're at in the GED. So we have new residents are coming. So I've had about three or four people in my office for the last two weeks saying the kids have not been in school all year because they don't have the assessment to the code for GED and they cannot go to any other school. Um, I think that's kind of wrong. The kids are 16, 17. If they're longer in school and the kids don't want to go to school, why we can't allow them not to go to school to get some education? They're, they're, the word was that they're saying because they won't finish in time enough. When I was in school, we had people in school 20 and 21, they were going to night school, but we always had kids to go to school. So where we're standing now, when kids are telling them they not to come to school to get their GED, and some of them can't even get the GED because they don't have the code. So I don't know, is this, a, this something for the school system? the school board or some for the city council, but I want to make sure you all heard this first because I heard we have a new superintendent and I don't know if she knows this, but we have a lot of kids and I can bring them all next time you have a council, let you all <laughs> let them speak on the behalf of this. Thank you, Thank you Mr. White. We will uh, forward your... Uh, uh, so that's something I can go with the school board. I just want to make yes. sure yes. Yes. I'm in the right yes. place. Okay. Yes, so I can tell them I, I was talking to you all first and I can go yeah. with it. Mr. Smeagol, the oh. uh, yeah. principal, he knows more about the education policy, but there's a compulsory age where uh, students, or uh, juveniles, students, if you will, uh, who are school age, by law, we must provide them an education unless the court has deemed otherwise. 16. Uh, and so... Um, 16. Uh, yeah, there's if they're looking for a program, uh, NTC, they have a program for students that are behind on their credits to catch up, and it's virtual. They're they're doing it virtually, so it's an online program that they they can enroll in. I think so, that's why they're, what they're having to enroll. They don't have they they supposed to gave them the code to do it, and the counselors are doing. It. The principal did, of the school I talked to late tell the principal she knew that was going on, so she got one uh, kid back in school because of that. So yeah. they're giving them something to do, but they can't even get in the well, code I, to get it. I can just tell you for accountability reasons, because uh, dropout um, counts against every high school for accreditation, right. that they're going to do everything they can to keep those kids in school wow. for as long as they can. So there's a disconnect somehow yeah. with the information and how it's being provided. And, I, I mean, there's there's tons of folks over on the school side. So I can't speak on their behalf, right. but I just know from my experience, there are uh, people that are over there. There's counselors that just work with students um, at NTC to help them catch up. So then where I can get that number, because we don't have them people we'll, here. We'll, we'll find a way to get it to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Good night. Mr. Catherine. Uh, Catherine yeah. Whitesell. Where's Catherine? There she is. Yeah. Catherine will take care of you, Mr. White. Uh, Ms. Doyle, did you want to say anything to Mr. White before he goes see Catherine? Well, in addition, just for the community to know, recall when we were at our retreat, Norfolk Public Libraries also has a GED program that they offer. It's so, well, NRJ has it too, but right. they were saying that the kids had to get a code from the school to say they can take the GED because some kids are not, we're told they were not eligible for take because they're not the age. Right. But That's these kids are 15, 16, 17, right. but they're telling they can't go to school and need yeah. to get a code. That's so they want to get the code, they can take it and go, but they right. have not gotten it. White, so yeah. Mr. White. And they she won't put a kid in a GED program until they are completely out of. The school system. The, yeah, school the system Norfolk or, Public Library yeah. one was a diploma program for 21 years and older. Okay. okay. I believe yeah. that's right. exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. They White. All right. Uh, Jerome Harrell, are you still here? I don't want that in there. And Bell. No, oh, this no. just says Harold on this paper, but we'll take you, Mr. Bell. You come on. Yeah. <laughs> since you, since you, that si no, no, it's not you, but this oh. is Plume. But since okay. you, since you're here, we'll take you. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm up there, so I appreciate that. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, my name is Jerome Bell. My address is 3053 Clark Drive, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Um, and um, so, some some people know here, I'm running for Congress of the Second District. And I'm really the only candidate that'll come down to Norfolk that's running for the second district and speak to you because they don't really care about the district because the district primarily votes Democratic. Well, I'm one of those candidates that don't um, forget forgotten communities. I don't take anyone for granted. But uh, history proves that without, without the right to bear arms, that people are not free and they live in fear. 
You can just look around the world at that. History of America proves that unjust laws unjustly affect black Americans in vastly more numbers than white Americans. You can just look at the prison uh, populations for that. History also proves that the first gun laws were against black men, black freed men. History proves that black men and families have been the target of extreme laws, surveillance, and social engineering to destroy the black family. COINTELPRO, as you all know, well, you should know, targeted Martin Luther King, the Black Panthers, and Malcolm X. President Johnson's New Deal gave us welfare, and that removed the black fathers out of the home. Ronald Reagan's war on drugs cracked down on the crack epidemic across the country where black men were arrested more than whites. They had the same amount of cocaine. And Bill Clinton's crime bill that Joe Biden wrote that Hillary Clinton famously called black youth super predators put more black people in prison than any president in history. And now, let us not forget some of your dear friends, or one of your dear friends. Mike, stop and frisk. Let's make Xerox copies of them. Let's just hand them over to the police since they all commit all the crimes. There's more need to stop black people than whites because he needs to save black people from themselves. And we don't know how to act in the workplace, so let's just put all the police in the black neighborhoods because that's where all the crime is. Bloomberg, who's running for president. Leaders that endorse this kind of rhetoric are no better than the person spewing it and fail the community. Make no mistake, Bloomberg's money in Virginia paid to enact up-to-date black codes and red flag laws that would target the black community in greater numbers just like history has proven. How about we focus on better schools? How about removing liquor stores from every corner in the black neighborhoods? How about creating jobs and showing our black people that, in fact, black lives do matter by removing Planned Parenthoods from black neighborhoods and getting rid of the violence of abortion? Gun control never works, especially when you are the target and you're the victim. Just ask the people of Chicago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Brian, we're going to have uh, David. David McClara, as well as uh, Brian Lee from the Fraternal Order of Police. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Good Mayor, evening, Council Members, City Manager. My name is David LaFleur. I am the president of the IBPO Nova Police Union. Uh, it's been a little while since I've been before you. That speaks well because you guys have done great things with uh, pay plans in the past. However, I always said that I would come back when we have some issues. So I've got some information. I'll try to put it out very quickly because I know we're on a time and you've been here a long time. Chief Boone and myself have been talking for um, a couple years now with some of the critical needs of the police department, mostly when it comes to manning and the issues that we have going on. Uh, studies have shown over the past few years a focus on uh, recruitment. Recent studies show that 67% nationwide recruitment is down uh, nationally when it comes to police uh, recruiting and law enforcement. Most recent studies coming out of uh, September 2019 shows a focus on retention, but new hires of police officers, 69% uh, of those police officers that join local police departments will leave within five years. 29% of those officers will leave within 12 months. We spend about $150,000, $200,000 to train a police officer, and we are training them for other localities, which brings me to what Chief Boone and I have come together and we've submitted back in September, which is a brand new pay plan and benefits package that will address the critical needs of the department. As of right now, we have 78 vacancies. When you add in modified duty, admin, uh, people on military leave, I have 123 officers that I do not have on the street right now. That is a whole precinct down. These are putting more efforts on the men and women that we have serving your community. We have to come to the table and, and, and address this because if we don't, a year from now, we're going to be talking about increased crime rates. We're going to be talking about other needs. And those are the things that affect people wanting to come to this city to live, bring their businesses. I've worked with Chief Boone on this plan, um, like I did the last pay plan, which y'all 
put together and, and, and approved. Uh, so I have, I have history with y'all. I know what the needs are. I know that it comes down to dollars. And I certainly can bring that to you on this plan. Um, this plan took a lot of research from other localities that are not seeing the deficiencies that uh, nationally we're, we're, we're no different than the majority of all national. However, we have a great opportunity with this plan that's been presented to be the gold standard. That's a term that's been used a lot. So uh, I hope that we can come to the table and, and, and talk before the budget gets approved. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, Brian. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little, a little about the same subject, but a little bit different. My name is Brian Lee. I'm president of the uh, Fraternal Order Police here in Norfolk. Uh, we not only represent Norfolk police officers, we also represent Norfolk Sheriff's Office, um, Sheriff's deputies, as well as retirees and even some federal officers. Um, it's a known fact that it's a struggle nationwide to recruit and retain personnel in police and sheriff's departments. Locally, Norfolk competes with several other large cities uh, to attract candidates. Once an officer or deputy is certified through an academy in Virginia, they become eligible for lateral transfer to many agencies within the state and even some out of state. This means that Norfolk can spend countless hours and dollars recruiting and training new officers and deputies just for them to take a job elsewhere with another agency. Norfolk needs a highly competitive, aggressive compensation plan that stands above our surrounding departments, a plan with competitive starting salary and the ability to reach maximum salary quicker. Currently, Norfolk Police Department is approximately $2,000 below Chesapeake and $3,000 below Virginia Beach in starting salaries. At that rate, it takes Norfolk officers three years of service on the street before they even meet what those departments are getting right out of the academy. Uh, it gets even worse with our sheriff's office. Right now, our, our sheriff's office is $6,000 below the starting salary of Chesapeake and Virginia Beach. Chesapeake and Virginia Beach Sheriff's Office recruits in the academy make the same as their police officers in the police academy. I, I couldn't find any information on where the scale goes from there, but they had the same starting salary, and it puts Norfolk $6,000 behind. We also represent our retirees with the Fraternal Order Police. Um, right now, they're all under the city of Norfolk retirement system, which has no annual cost of living adjustments built in. There are many officers out there who have been retired for 20 to 30 years and still currently receiving about the co same compensation they received the day they retired. Okay, that's 30 years with the same salary. Uh, the closest thing we have to our retirement system here in Norfolk is the Virginia Retirement System, uh, which has a built-in cost of living allowance yearly. It varies, I guess, based on uh, the uh, index or whatever they use. Uh, but over the last 40 years, uh, the Virginia Retirement System has provided an average 2.9 year percent increase uh, for people under that retirement system. Uh, Tonight, I'm asking the council strongly consider an aggressive compensation plan for the upcoming fiscal year budget for officers and deputies in the city. Uh, Norfolk deserves the best public safety personnel possible, and they deserve a competitive compensation for it. I'm also asking the council strongly consider a yearly cost living adjustment for our retirees beginning the upcoming fiscal year budget. Our retirees need and deserve a yearly cost of living increase, and I want to thank all of you for your time tonight. Thank you. Mary, Mary Zachary. Ms. Zachary. Followed by Daniel again. Good afternoon. 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 And I still don't know what y'all doing. And I haven't heard from you. You say you're going to call me. You didn't ever get in touch when you first took over. And I'm very disappointed. I keep coming down here. Y'all pacify me. I'm too old to be pacified. I need to be satisfied at this point. And the only thing going to satisfy our community is a grocery store. I've been going to the library. I looked up some literature about from, um, I believe it was Jacksonville, Florida, where they bought their grocery store into their community because IGA had given up and moved out the city. So there's the mayor, whatnot, 
they form their own little grocery there. And then I would like to know something about intimate domain. Can't we take over and y'all give them some kind of slush fun or something? We are starving over there. It's not funny. We are really hungry. I've lost weight since I lived in Berkeley. I've been there 10 years too long. I'm getting out. I got to go. I cannot live like this. There's little children on in, the, in the neighborhood. They don't have no vegetables, no fruit. And it's sad. It is really sad. How could you leave your community like that? This is your community. You leaving your community helpless. It's not my community. I'm not from Berkeley, but I'm fighting for everybody over there. Because every time I catch the bus down here, it costs me time. And I'm fighting to go home out there now. But I got to be here to give my opinion. I'm going to come until I can't come no more. So you might as well look for me. And I'm going to still say the same thing each and every time. Until you get tired of me, you can lock the door. Oh, well, I'm going to say what I got to say. Y'all have a good evening. I got to catch the bus. Good night. And Ms. Zachary, Ms. Zachary, before you leave. Yeah. Before you leave, there's a, there's a tall gentleman in the back. Wait right here. He's responsible for your growth. He's here today. He wasn't here before. Oh, yeah. That's him. You talk with him yet? Yeah, not tonight, but get him. Y'all keep right. giving me a run around. I don't want to talk to none of y'all. So. All right. He's the one. He's, he's economic development. Uh, Danny Lee Ginn. My name is Danny Lee Ginn. I reside at 3844 Dare Circle. Uh, I'm going to clear up the, the last business of 2019 uh, so I can move into 2020 uh, the next time around. Uh, the last time I was here, uh, we were taking a look at Paul Riddick. Uh, I had kind of evaluated all of you because uh, I've been coming here for 16 years, uh, far longer than 10. Uh, and um, we took, were taking a look at Paul Riddick. <clears throat> we established that he was a black racist because he's admitted so in this very council. We admitted that he was a bully because we've watched him bully Tommy Smeagol and uh, Angela Graves. And the third point I was going to make uh, was the fact that he's vulgar. Now, I say this because before any of you got here, uh, there was a citizen who would show up every week and there was a city manager, uh, Regina Williams, that was losing thousands and thousands of dollars and nobody could explain where the money was going to. And this individual would come up and, and bring documentation and challenge it. Now he came up at one point and challenged Regina Williams and uh, at the end of the council meeting as he turned to leave, uh, Paul Riddick bellowed out in this very chamber, Danny, you don't know your ass from a hole in the ground. Now, Danny didn't re uh, respond. He was kind of shocked at that. And uh, he looked up, and again, Paul Riddick said, did you hear me, Danny? You don't know your ass from a hole in the ground. Now, that's kind of vulgar, uh, and it's kind of unacceptable. But what worries me is not so much what Paul Riddick did. It's the fact that... Uh, the council members have the right to be vulgar, they have the right to be bullying, they have the right to be racist, but there, no, there are no rules of conduct uh, as they are for me. Well, Mr. Ginn, you cannot use vulgarity, you cannot be violent, uh, you cannot disrupt the orderly conduct, uh, but there are no rules or regulations uh, for any of you uh, to conduct yourself. Do you know Michael Palmer? Uh, Angela D. Hart? Thank you. Thank you for having me. This yes. is my first time ever speaking. Well, welcome. So, thank you. Um, my name is Angela D. Hart, 1721 Eastbourne Drive, Virginia Beach. Um, I'm here today about the Second Amendment. Um, there's no doubt we have a violence problem in the United States, gun control, right? Um, I'm not qualified to say what those causes are, and there's not time to discuss it tonight, right? But definitely, Ronald Reagan said it best when he said government is not the solution to the problem. It is the problem. Um, this has always been true since the birth of civilization. 
Um, our founding fathers drafted our Constitution because they lived during a time when tyrannical government rule was a reality. We don't know that reality. We're fortunate. Everyone in this room has lived benefited by their divinely inspired idea that we now take for granted. We live their dream. Their dream that we can speak out, we can question our government without retaliation. We live that dream that we can bear arms to defend ourselves and our families against any force that seeks, us, seeks to deprive us from our God-given rights. That includes a tyrannical government, another go tyrannical government, or even our own worst case scenario. Thanks to our Constitution, we live with a sense of entitlement to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we have an unshakable confidence that that constitutional right will always be there. And I'm grateful for it. But we've now become dangerously complacent. We've forgotten how hellish life can be without those constitutional freedoms. We have forgotten the lessons that drove our founding fathers to enshrine our constitutional rights. And they tried to teach us by enshrining these constitutional rights. Right now, we're all like frogs in the boiling pot. We're warm, we're comfy, and all the while, there are subversive forces steaming away our constitutional rights. Um, with the country divided almost exactly down the middle on almost every major issue, we're now at the point where everyone has to make a stand to try to keep this republic, or we face losing it. Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, and, and Portsmouth the very founding cities of this great nation have taken a stand for the Second Amendment, and I would like to invite you all to do the same with us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Paul, Paul Davis, followed by Bob Brown. My name is Paul Davis, uh, 120 Kidd Boulevard, Norfolk, Virginia, 23502. I'd like to uh, speak with you. About, I've been here uh, four times already, but I told you I wasn't coming back till I could have you all under arrest. And I promised this man right here that I would be back when I had the evidence. So wanted you to know we found the results. Remember the petition of the corporation that petitioned my land? Well, what that turned out to be that you guys, according to the FBI, defrauded the federal government. You're all being charged. I file tomorrow. Uh, so you're all looking at 27 years. You all need good attorneys. Good attorneys, Mr. Pishko. Uh, we, uh, Mr. File, a pleasure to meet you, sir. Glad to have you here. Uh, did you have wonderful things about you over from ODU, from the president, and you're glad to have you. Unfortunately, these people you probably won't be working with. We're charging them with defrauding the federal government. You all have a nice day. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Bob, Bob Brown, followed by... Um, Brendan Mooney. Good evening. I'm not here to threaten or arrest anybody, just so you know. Thank you. I might cost you some money down the road because I'm persistent, as every one of you know. I'm Bob Brown, 8507 Troy Street, and I'm chairman of the Norfolk Republican Party. I'm the founder of the Norfolk Second Amendment Preservation Coalition. And as you know, we have filed uh, the Second Amendment Preservation Ordinance and we're out getting signatures and I'm going to read it to you. Section 1, the City of Norfolk shall not exercise any authority granted to it by Title 15.2 of the Code of Virginia, its charter or otherwise, to regulate or prohibit the purchase, possession, transfer, ownership, carrying, storage, or transporting of firearms, ammunition, or components, or a combination thereof. This prohibition includes any authority existed at the time of enactment of the ordinance or any authority extended in the future. The terms used in this ordinance shall have the meaning defined in Title 18.2 of the Code of Virginia. Section 2, if the City of Norfolk designates any property, including City Hall, owned by it as a firearms-free zone, the City of Norfolk shall waive its sovereign immunity as it relates to any energy sustained by persons lawfully present in such firearms-free zones. You know, all these people have been coming to you asking you to put a simple resolution on the, on, the, on the agenda, and you could have done it by now, and I wouldn't be standing up here wearing this nice wet shirt. 
And I have a lot of supporters. I have 40 people out gathering me signatures right now. We've notarized last night. We're at Franklin's restaurant. We notarized 800 signatures. I have 15 people haven't turned in their petitions. As you well know, under the charter, under Section 30 and Section 31, going to 32, when I collect 1,250 signatures, I turned them in Allen Bowl. I was hoping to do it tonight for Ben Bench some great theater, but it is to be what it is. Mr. Bull, I'll be seeing you very soon. I have another issue to bring up, and, and one of our mandates of the Republican Party of Virginia is to is voter registration. First time we came here, we had three-tenths. Of course, we didn't have a permit. Now, every time I seek a permit, I'm denied a little more than a, I got a chair this time. I do appreciate the chair. I'm 100% disabled, but I'm trying to register both healthy voters and disabled voters. And it's very difficult when you have arthritis, carpal tunnel syndrome, any of these maladies that will keep you from sitting there with a clipboard in your hand. I have a hard time, I could barely write. So I really, I'm coming back. I really like a table when I come back, Mr. Fishko. I hope you'll grant that, because I know that uh, a lot of people occur in your water, but I know what bullying it is. And when I was a kid, I was bullied. I was called pizza face, fingers. I spent a year and a half of my life laying in a hospital bed. I've had over 60 operations. I know bullying. You're a bully. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mooney and uh, William Jackson, Sr. Follow. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Brendan Mooney, one of the executive members for uh, Virginia Sins Defense League. I'm here from uh, Virginia Beach. Um, first of all, I must say I now know more about Airbnb than I think I've ever wanted to know. Um, I've, I've been, uh, I've been to a lot of these city council meetings. I also, last time I was behind a microphone, was speaking to 75,000 people to show up in Richmond, and it was awe-inspiring. Um, we have a serious concern here. Norfolk is one of the only cities that still is not a sanctuary city. Now, I understand that that means a lot to come from you guys for the people here in Norfolk. I regularly do business here in Norfolk. I own an IT company that I have clients here. I also do a church there at Trinity Church in uh, Norfolk here and there, there at the Nokia, so we appreciate you guys helping us out with that. But I'm not here for that today. As you guys know very well, the Second Amendment is under attack, and we are scared as not only residents of Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Suffolk, and Portsmouth who have passed similar resolutions, we're scared at what is going on in Richmond will not allow us to come over here to Norfolk. I, I really am petrified if they try and pass these rules and laws that you guys will enforce these unconstitutional laws, and that's terrifying. Um, I was in a mall shooting back in 08 uh, outside of uh, Seattle. And seeing the gun-free zones and things that are, people are trying to do, the mall I was at was a gun-free zone. I was only 100 yards or so away from the person that was committing the crime, and it was, it was frightening. And from that day forward, I always said, no matter what I can do legally, I'm going to make sure I'm armed. Uh, I have my, uh, my business lawyer. He, he's a, a Jewish gentleman, and he faces anti-Semitism on a daily basis. His wife has been threatened, and it's, it's frightening. And I have friends that have, have reached out from uh, liberal gun owners of America, um, that have said, hey, we have a lot of LGBTQ people that are being discriminated against. We have other minorities that are being discriminated against. The trans community is one of the most harassed and discriminated against people out there. And unfortunately, your guys are great police. They do a wonderful job. But when you're being robbed because they don't like what your gender is, these people deserve those rights to be able to defend themselves. And we're just worried that if they pass on U.S. laws and make it harder, those people are going to be affected. And I would hate for you guys as city council to have to hear about that in the news. You guys' as police department has been doing wonderful work. I read it in the news. But they're not there all the time. They'll even tell you themselves they can't be there 100% of the time. And I just want to make sure that you guys can be able to support the citizens here in Norfolk. I really do. And I really appreciate your time. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Thank you. Mr. Jackson, followed by uh, Marcus Gorin. Evening, Mayor Alexander. Evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, and all the honorable members of the city council. I, uh, my name is William D. Jackson, Sr. I reside at 3709 Buckingham Street 
in Norfolk, Virginia, and that's in the Esterbrook section of the city. Here we go again. I will begin tonight by asking each of you seated here in front of me to take a good, hard, thoughtful look at all these people back here. They're good people, as you are. I, like many of them, are here, some of us, for the third and fourth time, or the fourth, third and fourth straight city council meeting. We have come here tonight again to ask this council to put forth and pass the Second Amendment Preservation Ordinance put forth by petition submitted to the council by the Second Amendment Preservation Coalition. <coughs> I've addressed this council a number of times. Some of the times there were issues that were of importance to my Civic League. Several times there were issues that were important to just me. This time, it's different. This time it's important to the every law-abiding, gun-owning citizen in the city of Norfolk, in the state of Virginia, and in these United States of America. I believe that the Virginia State General Assembly's majority party is trying to disarm we the people. I'm not the only one that believes this. As you heard just a little while ago, this is why 91 of Virginians, 95 counties, 15 cities, and 30 towns in the state have passed some sort of Second Amendment, sanctuary, constitutional, or preservation ordinance way past time that the city of Norfolk joins those people. I thank you for your attention. Marcus Gorin, followed by Reed Grinman. Marcus Goring, 2249 Maple Street, Virginia Beach, 23451. Um, as my speaker before said, 91 of 95 counties are in some form Second Amendment counties. And I was asking myself, this is the second time I'm speaking in front of you council members and wondering, why aren't you bringing this up to a vote? What is the reason? Are you afraid of showing your colors <coughs> if you're pro or against it? I just don't understand it. It's the fourth time as I hear that people have been speaking about this matter. What's the problem? Are you afraid of getting reelected? What's, I don't understand the matters behind your decision of not putting this up for a vote. Show your colors. Thank you. Reed, followed by Michelle Riley. Good evening, members of Norfolk City Council. My name is Reed Greenman. I live in Virginia Beach. This is the first time I've ever addressed you. I want to talk a little bit about something you probably haven't stopped to think about on the Second Amendment resolution issue. I work in Norfolk, although I live in Virginia Beach. Michelle and I, we love Norfolk. We are members of the Norfolk Botanical Garden. We are members of the Norfolk Zoo. We participate, Andrea, in event on your uh, Engage Norfolk event three years in a row as we are Virginia Beach Tea Party board members. As you know, Dr. Alexander, since you take selfies with us. <laughs> we love the history. Michelle and I went to the Hermitage House last Friday night. It is a treasure absolute treasure. They had a uh, special event called Style and Flair exhibiting Mrs. Sloan's clothes. We sail on board the American Rover and we love that. We sail on board the Spirit of Norfolk. 
we take the Elizabeth River Ferry and go back and cross from Waterside over to Portsmouth, have a drink, and come back just to see the fireworks over the bay. We go to Admirals games to watch hockey. We go to the ballpark to watch ball games. My daughter was a cheerleader at ODU. I took classes at ODU. I've worked across the street at Dominion Tower for CACI on Plume Street for Trader Publishing Company, and I now work on Robin Hood Road near the airport. My girlfriend is an amazing florist, and we buy our flowers from Norfolk Wholesaler. We go to the Wells Theater to attend Virginia Stage Company events. We go to Nauticus. We love touring the Battleship Wisconsin. We shop here. We do antique stores. You have some amazing antique stores on Granby Street, 21st Street. We love coming here and spending our money. We really do. Maya Luna is one of our favorite uh, restaurants and so is Off the Hook next door. We love the nightlife down at Waterside. We are law-abiding, tax-paying citizens who come here and spend our money and have a great time in Norfolk. Like I said, Botanical Gardens is one of our favorite places. But we don't come here unarmed. We take care of our children and ourselves by arming ourselves to protect ourselves. And as every one of these law enforcement officers will tell you, they can't be everywhere at all at one time. Mayor, uh, Mr. Riddick, if you don't vote on this and support our constitutional rights to bear and keep arms, you're going to lose our business. I got plenty of places to buy antiques. I got plenty of places to go to enjoy and spend my money. <clears throat> like you were asked, bring this up for a vote. Support our constitutional rights. Allow us to defend ourselves and shop and spend our money in your city. Thank you. I ask you to do this. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Riley, followed by Daniel Short. Good evening. It's nice to see you all tonight. My name is Michelle Riley. I'm a resident of Virginia Beach. Um, while I echo a lot of the things that the other people here up here have said, um, I did a little bit of research to prepare my remarks for tonight. And I came across some statistics that scared me a little bit, especially as Reed stated, he and I spend a lot of time in Norfolk, and I, I was a little bit shocked when I found this out. Um, Apparently, Norfolk has a crime rate of 41 per 1,000 residents, which is one of the highest crime rates in America compared to all communities of all sizes. Now, before I continue, I just want to say that I don't mean any disrespect to our police officers in this city because I know police officers work incredibly hard and they do the best they can with what they've got and they put their lives on the line every single day and I have utmost respect for our officers. But considering some of these statistics that I found, I found out that uh, one's chance of becoming a victim of either a violent or a property crime in Norfolk is one in 24. Um, I guess there's about 245,000 residents in Norfolk and about 750 police officers from what I could find. That's one police officer for every 326 residents. Now, how, how in the world does it make logical sense to not pass a Second Amendment resolution protecting people's rights to bear arms with statistics like this. Norfolk is a beautiful, wonderful city, but I'm going to tell you right now, just walking from the East parking lot over here to this lovely building made me glad to have my Second Amendment rights. Um, as Reed said, we enjoy so many beautiful things about this city, but you keep continuing to have citizens that come in here over and over again asking you to please pass this resolution. I can't vote for you, obviously, so I'm pretty sure that my opinion doesn't mean that much. My little bit of money that I spend in Norfolk isn't going to break the bank for any of you. But if enough people stop coming here because they could go to cities where their rights are protected 
Or if enough people decide maybe they don't want to live in Norfolk because they'd rather live in Chesapeake or Suffolk or Virginia Beach or Portsmouth or any of the other sister cities here in Tidewater that have passed these resolutions, eventually it will make an economic impact on your city. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, it, if the fact that you're kind of breaking your oath to uphold the Constitution by not passing this resolution doesn't mean anything, then the economic impact should. Thank you Thank so you. much. Daniel Short. Good evening, Mayor Alexander, City Council. Um, I'm Daniel Short, 2400 Hampton Boulevard, a retired military officer, combat veteran, and business owner in your city. Um, we have generated millions and millions of dollars within this city, and we've paid hundreds of thousands of, in taxes, and I will not stay in a city that does not protect my constitutional rights. The United States and Virginia constitutions were established to protect we the people from you, the government. The United States Constitution's Fifth Amendment guarantees that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken without just compensation. The Fifth Amendment's fourth distinct constitutional right guarantees that all defendants receive a fair trial. Boiled down, it means the Constitution guarantees innocent until proven guilty. Mike Bloomberg supported New York's stop and frisk policy. Although it was effective in reducing illegal weapons, in 2013, U.S. District Ju uh, Court Judge Shira A. Scheinlin ruled that the city police had violated the U.S. Constitution and the way it carried out the stop and frisk program. Judge Scheinlin said that stop and frisk could only be used where there is a reasonable basis for suspicion of an individual. Stop and frisk had turned the law upside down to become guilty until proven innocent, which is why she ruled against it. The Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States and the Virginia Constitution's guarantee the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Infringed is not ambiguous in its definition. Mayor, Bloom Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Northam's attempt to erase the Second Amendment has the same implications as stop and frisk. It declares that law-abiding citizens are guilty without due process of law and deprives them of property. In short, we become guilty until proven innocent. I am a citizen who under this law would automatically be found guilty and like the other citizens of Virginia, do not even get a chance to prove ourselves innocent. So, although this legislation was temporarily killed in the Virginia Senate, I urge the Norfolk City Council to declare Norfolk a sanctuary city and send a message to the governor and Mayor Bloomberg that Norfolk still honors the United States and Virginia constitutions. And absolutely no disrespect to the armed men in blue surrounding me, but when seconds count, the police will be there in minutes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.